invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 11. As we continue this journey on our study of the Pharisees, I've labeled this section of Scripture, Signs You Are a Pharisee. And we're going to continue our third message on this line of reasoning. And in case the Pharisees need not be alone, one of the next things you're going to be looking at is signs you are a legalist for. Now he's going to address those lawyers that are next. Luke chapter 11, we're just going to focus on verse 43. Luke eleven forty three. 43. Woe unto you, Pharisees, for you love the uppermost seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the marketplace. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our message this morning. Father, as we come together this day to worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord, we do ask that it would be a time of great reflection, that we would soul search ourselves, compare ourselves to Scripture. I pray, Lord, that you would guide and direct us to be honest with ourselves. It's very easy to put on a facade. It's difficult to now be honest internally. But Lord, I pray that that battle within us would be very real this day. And it would be a battle of the Spirit versus the flesh and that the Spirit of God would win out. Father, I agree with John the Baptist when he said, I must decrease and Christ must increase. Lord, hide this foolish preacher behind the cross of Christ that Christ alone might be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. A few weeks ago, we began this passage looking at an interaction of a particular Pharisee who had invited Jesus over for a meal. When the Pharisee saw that Jesus did not wash his hands prior to the meal, the Pharisee was greatly offended. Now, we did establish that this offense was not based on a lack of sanitation on Jesus' part, but rather that Jesus was not complying to the ceremonial tradition of the Pharisees that they had added on top of the law of Moses. The Pharisees, of course, are a religious group popular to the brand of Judaism during the time of Christ. Most often... The New Testament views them as rotten kind of people, not ones you would want to be in the presence of. However, they did have some good parts about their character. I think for the most part, many had the right intentions. They didn't necessarily pull it off correctly, but they did want to be holy and considered God's holiness to be something to strive for. Number two, they did pray a lot, dozens of times a day. They memorized great portions of the scriptures. They had a passion to obey all of the law of God, including the 613 commandments in the Old Testament. But as true with many movements, fanatics added to the law and they went awry. They developed their own theological system by adding on to the scriptures. Factions within the Pharisees began to revise their own theologies and their hearts became very hard towards the Lord. Thus far, we have identified behaviors of a Pharisee. The three that we've identified is, number one, a Pharisee is hard on others, but easy on himself. Number two, a Pharisee places value on formality rather than fellowship with God. Number three, a Pharisee appears to give God his heart, but inwardly, does not. And so this morning, we're going to add on to this list with a fourth principle. A Pharisee enjoys the spotlight on himself instead of God. The Lord has allowed us to live in a very beautiful portion of this country we call New England. This portion is amazing. We have one, th one thing that many folks don't have in other portions of the country, and it's something that you probably enjoyed much. 
lighthouses. When Andy and I were first married, we started collecting lighthouses. We don't have many places to display them as of these days, but we do have a collection of them. We went up to York Beach, Maine, and my favorite lighthouse is the Nubble Light in York. When I was a kid, we had a dear, dear family friend that lived just a stone throw from the lighthouse. We would go see her and her husband every single summer. Mom and Dad always had to stop downtown York to the Goldenrod Candy Shop. We would watch the taffy being made through the windows. It was always an enjoyable time. You know, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 says, Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. That verse reminds me of the noble light. In the darkness of the world, we are to be a beacon of light to the lost. The lighthouse is intended to focus a beam that cuts out into the darkness as far and as brightly as possible. Do you know what a lighthouse is not? A lighthouse is not a spotlight that seeks to bring attention to itself. What good would a lighthouse be if it lit its tower and didn't reach out over the waves? No, a lighthouse does something completely opposite. It gives the light out to the sea. When I was in college, I once in a while acted in Shakespearean plays. I never had an important role or anything like that, but I might have had a line or two. As you step on stage in front of 3,000 people to act, a spotlight would come upon the player. And the spotlight showed that it was this person's now to speak. All the room's attention was on that person speaking. Most wouldn't have any idea that that person was speaking unless the spotlight was on them. It was a fun time. There's a story I'll tell you maybe another time. I got stabbed by a sword from my history professor. Spotlight was on both of us at, this, at that point in time. The point of a spotlight is to put a focus on someone. Do you know who loved the spotlight? The Pharisees. They loved being the center of attention. Their actions were not meant to glorify the Lord. They were meant to bring glory to themselves. And for them, it was a really bad habit. A lot of people enjoy the attention on themselves because it brings an emotional high, like a cheap drug of sorts, but it keeps them looking for their next fix. They will do just about anything to get it, include throwing a temper tantrum or bad behavior because at least some attention is better than none in their minds. Do you understand, my dear friends, that God did not design the human race that way? That is a product of our fallen sin nature. We are created for the purpose of not bringing glory to ourselves, but rather what? Glory to the Lord. We are supposed to reflect God's glory, not attempt to have a cheap substitute that is our own. Paul told the Ephesians, we exist for the praise and the glory of God's grace. He told the Corinthians to do all things to the glory of God. So to put yourself in the spotlight is to violate God's attention for you. Now, I do understand that it happens. Why? Because we like attention. That's why. We like it when people look on us and applaud and approve. We enjoy the authority or the power it brings. Some love 
popularity. For some, it provides a sense of control. Well, let me ask you this. What did Jesus do? And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. If there is one that deserved all the attention, it would be whom? The Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, to whom did Jesus consistently thrust the attention upon? God the Father. And so we're going to keep the same proposition that we've been working on in these last few messages about the Pharisees. Pharisaical behavior is a sign of a heart that is far from God. Seeking the spotlight for yourself is a sign of a heart that is far from God. Let's look at verse 43 this morning. Woe unto you, Pharisees, for you all love the uppermost seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. The concept that Jesus is pointing out here in our text is not necessarily easy identifiable uh, in Western culture. So we're going to pause here just a moment to understand what Jesus meant. Number one, he gave a woe to the Pharisees. We have touched on this topic a few times, but it's important that we pause here for a moment as it's in our text yet again. Just what exactly does woe mean? Our Lord uses it quite often. It's not a message of glad tidings. We must not get it confused with the English forms of the word woe. Typically, you'll hear the word woe in old westerns or you watch a cowboy movie. What does a cowboy say to his, hat, to his horse? Whoa! I saw Nathan wearing a bolo tie today, and I think he's a cowboy this morning. Looks good, Nathan. Rick's wearing one too. That's not the right woe. has nothing to do with a horse. Or sometimes we will use the word woe as a surprise. If you're my son, you will use the word woe followed by dude. <laughs> That's not the same word either. The word that Jesus is using in this text does not mean whoa, horsey, or dude, whoa, but rather... It's the Greek word that denotes pain, displeasure, or grief. Uai is the word. It's primarily an exclamation of grief tied to a warning of judgment that is coming. Jesus used this word woe against the Pharisees, not as an exclamation, but as a declaration or a divine pronouncement that he truly was grieved that they are going to be under the judgment of God unless they change their behavior. Now, Jesus is not wishing for damnation on these false leaders. He came to die for them. It's not that Jesus desires for them to be judged, but rather that they hear his woe and that they repent and come to salvation that he is offering to them. Jesus knows that if they don't repent and believe, there is a right, uh, an unrighteous path of judgment reserved for them and they will receive the full wrath of God. And so that brings the Savior grief of woe. Jesus takes no joy in seeing people damned to hell. It's grievous to God. So this woe is a most serious, serious word. When you read it in the Scriptures, pay close attention for it's a grief of God with impending judgment. Scriptures often 
will be presented to us, and we'll read a short word like that, but think, not think much of it. But there's a lot tied to the love of God in this word. It serves as a warning, especially to us in 2022. For if Jesus is saying woe, we have to pause and see exactly why he is doing so. And if we are in danger of repeating the same behavior, we are also in danger of God's judgment on us. And so Jesus is now going to transfer from this woe to a description of what these Pharisees are doing that violates God's law and makes God grieved. What does he say? You all love the uppermost seats in the synagogues. Well, that's as clear as day, isn't it? No, not exactly. Synagogues, at this point in time in history, continued to be the focal point of Jewish life during that first century in which Jesus was on earth, physically. By the time Jesus' ministry began, a synagogue was found in almost every town in Galilee. Synagogues were places of prominence, Typically, they were elevated geographically higher than other places as to symbolize an important place of God being above people. In some cases, the front facade was three doors wide. Outside at the entrance as you would enter into the synagogue was a mikvah, a baptismal tank. No, baptismal tanks are not original to the Baptists. But I will claim that New England Shores is on record for having the biggest baptismal tank in the world. It's about 1.6 miles down that way, and it is cold right now, right? Inside the synagogue were important benches that people sat on. They typically lined two or three walls of the inside of the synagogue. Those benches were called the chief seats. They were reserved for the most important people in society. They could be seen by all during synagogue services, especially for those who lined the back wall behind the reader on the seat of Moses who would read the law out, or the person giving the spiritual application of the scriptures for the day. So Jesus' criticism to the Pharisees is that they want to be at the front and center of all Jewish religious life. That gives them an emotional high. By the way, do you know where the common people in the synagogues sat? On the floor. In most synagogues, the floor was made of dirt. Some had tile, many had dirt. So the Pharisees were too wonderful and glorious to sit on the floor with the common people. They needed these chief seats. They could be seen by all. Jesus now condemns this type of behavior wanting to be recognized as great by all. You ever see a church that takes its leadership and puts them behind the preacher so that there is this massive council, and if you are somebody in the church, you get to sit on stage during the sermon? That drives me batty. It really does. I'm not saying that it's a sin to do that. I know it's a very formal thing in many churches. But you know what happens when you do that is that the people start paying attention to all the load of people behind the speaker and the pastor so that that now sets the tone. How did so-and-so react when pastor said that? Well, I better react that way too. It creates a level of expectation that I'm not comfortable with. I would just rather hold up the scriptures in our church and say, this is what God's word says. Let's follow it. 
not look and see what's brother holy so-and-so doing. Again, that's just one of my pet peeves. And if you've attended or attending a church that does such, I don't have a mandate against it. As long as they're not acting like the chief seats of the Pharisees, then we have a problem. So Jesus criticizes the religious life for those who want to be recognized inside the synagogues. I think the application is very clear, that if you are going to be a member and serve at New England Shores Baptist Church, you've got to be very careful that you're not doing it in order to gain attention in the chief seats. Now, we empty Tyler out and Josh out before the preaching. But you have to be careful about the attention that you seek if you're going to serve in ministry. For your flesh is going to want attention. It is going to want the spotlight. My dear friends, be a one-way street sign that always points to Jesus Christ alone. Jesus doesn't stop here with just religious life. He now talks about social life. Verse 43, they seek attention and greetings in the market or the marketplace. Now, this is not the only passage in that Jesus mentions them. There's going to be multiple others throughout the Gospels about attention in the marketplace. But I want you to turn over to Matthew chapter 23 with me and look at Matthew's description. Now, this event is still in the future, but it illustrates exactly what we're talking about. Matthew 23, verse 1. Matthew 23, verse 1. Then Jesus spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. I believe, again, that's a reference inside the synagogue. There would be one special seat where a rabbi or someone asked would come and open the the law of Moses, and read it. Jesus has done this in the history that we've studied him. The scribes and the Pharisees, they seek the attention of Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and don't do it. They read the law of Moses to you, but they have no evidence that it's backed up in their lives. Verse 4, they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, lay them on men's shoulders. They themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. There's an expectation that these Pharisees and scribes placed on the people that they wouldn't even do themselves. Verse 5, but all their works they do for to be seen of men. Make it broad, their phylacteries. Those are boxes either on the wrist or on their foreheads that have scripture written in them and placed on there. The bigger the phylactery, the more holy you are, the most decorated phylactery, you're beautiful. It's utter foolishness. They would enlarge the borders of their garments with tassels and decorations to show how glorious they were. And they loved the uppermost rooms at feasts. It's interesting. You know, um, how many of you have recently had a birthday party? Glad you don't have Pharisees at your birthday party. You know why? Because they would show up to your birthday party and not care about you because it's about them. That's a Pharisee. The chief seats in the synagogues and at feasts. And look at verse 7. And greetings in the market. And be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not called rabbi for one is your master even christ and you all are brethren call no man your father upon the earth for one is your father which is in heaven jesus is saying very very clearly that this behavior to seek attention to yourself not only in the religious sector but now in the secular places pharisees and scribes would put on beautiful flowing robes so that they could be seen and identified as different. And they would walk through the marketplace in a 
way that would flaunt their glory so people could rush up to them and call them Rabbi or Master, Great Teacher, Father. Jesus says, don't do that. By the way, is there anybody that kind of dresses funny and likes to be called Father in this day and age? Huh. What does Jesus say? For one is your Father which is in heaven. No man is to call you Father on earth. That has nothing to do with Daddy, okay? This is recognition of absolute authority. Now look at verse 11. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. He who dies with the least amount of toys wins. That's right. You mean, Pastor, I can be a member of this local church? and never get a single piece of recognition from everyone and be the greatest member of the church? Indeed you can. Because the greatest among you is your slave, the one who serves all, just like Jesus Christ. The Pharisees love to receive attention. They love to look good in front of others. When others would see them, they enjoyed being in the spotlight. They had this overwhelming desire to be noticed and adorned as a VIP. What is the greatest position that you can ever be in as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ? A servant to others. The fundamental problem of a Pharisee was that they wanted the spotlight on themselves and did not want to deflect it so it shined on God. My dear friends, shoot for the moon. What is the moon's source of light? Itself? No, it reflects the sun. Dear Christians, reflect the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need to be the center of attention in the spotlight. You don't need to try to make yourself feel re relevant. Jesus died for you. You're already relevant in the sight of God. I came up with eight ways that you can tell that you want to be in the spotlight. Number one, you have to one-up everyone with a bigger and better story. I see your story, and I submit my own because it's even better than yours. That's a bad habit people get into. Don't do that. Number two, you believe your church just got significantly better because you walked through the front door. Hmm? I've arrived. We can start now. Number three, you feel you are a much better teacher than so-and-so. I would even say this, you feel that you're a much better pastor than pastor so-and-so. Number three, you crave attention from other people and you are consumed with looking good in front of them. Number five, you're hungry for power. You want the feeling of being dominant over others gives you a sense of being in control. Number six, you desire praise and work hard to achieve it so you can earn the praise and adoration of other people. Number seven, you throw tantrums physically and emotionally when you do not get your own way. And that is not reserved for children. Number eight, you try to punish others who hold differing opinions when you do not get your own way. Do any of those describe you this morning? People who seek the spotlight 
will experience sleepless nights when they don't get the attention that they want. Sometimes they'll even scheme bad behavior because they can bring some sort of attention to themselves and some sort is better than none. And even when that attention is gained, it's not going to secure the needs of your soul. You still will feel empty, fragile, panicky, and insecure. There are those that seek the spotlight, and you may know, not know from the outside, but inside they are some of the most lonely people you will ever meet. Their lives are filled with experiences with no meaning. They have many acquaintances, but no real relationships. And, and there is a hole in their soul. Without God at the center of your attention, you will become a black hole, sucking in the attention of others with an emptiness inside. And in the process, you're not attracting people to yourselves. You are actually driving them away because nobody wants to see you in the spotlight. Does that describe you this morning? That's what the Pharisees did. Let's go back to the principle that we started with this morning. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5.16 are you seeking to reflect the light of God into this dark world? Or are you seeking to put yourself in the spotlight so you can receive all the attention because of the emotional high it brings you? The only way for any man, whether saved or unsaved, to fulfill the purpose of his creation is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Being a Pharisee who seeks his own way is a dark and miserable path that God has never intended for you. Are you willing to be honest between yourself and the Lord this morning? Are you willing to put down your flesh and say, I have been seeking attention for myself? Whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Pharisaical behavior is a sign of a heart that is far from God. Father, thank you for this text of Scripture this morning. Lord, I pray that you would use it mightily. I pray, Father, that you would rebuke those who struggle with pharisaical tendencies of this nature. Father, help us to deflect any attention we may get and thrust it on the one who deserves it all, our Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray.